This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunchan, and Tim Dahl, episode number 163. Welcome back, Tim. You just got back from a, a European jaunt. Yes, last night, and ah, I had a great time. It was uh, Switzerland and Germany, and, um, you know, I, I enjoy playing. I played with Azumi OE. Uh, we ran into, well, we played a show de fond in Switzerland, which... You're going to be going there in January and uh, Beth supposedly, Beep, supposedly. Beth Beep, well, as of now, they're still talking about it. So it seems like it's on. Um, Beth B was there, which is nice to see her, yep. um, you know, a bunch of maniacs. And I got to do what I do with a, a Zoom OE, which I think went over very well. And fantastic. Uh, and that's the Buto dancer that you work with. Who's yes. Fantastic. Two piece. Yeah. 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 And it's a, it's a visual. It, it's something different than just what I, my music it's, and it's, it's expanded some of my uh, things in a, po- in a positive way. Cause I, well, you know. absolutely. And look, I mean, you do all kinds of music, so you can't say <laughs> it's always different. So that's, what's good. Fair, fair enough. Uh, Schiphol airport, which was my connection from Berlin yesterday's garbage, oh. but they've been, they've been suffering all summer. Um, and I guess they're just not staffed. And there's uh, one thing I was revealing when I landed is that, um, there's a lot of construction. So they're doing this whole rebuild thing that is in Schiphol. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 not happening. How many hours in advance did you get to the airport? Well, so my first flight was Berlin and that that went smoothly. Um, and not to not to bore the listener here, but the uh, you know, the security, you know, carry on uh check not checking but you know that to cross yeah. into the gates thing right near where my check-in was it was like just jam-packed and i've been going to berlin airport a lot lately i was like oh wait there's this other one way down at the end of the hallway where there's like no check-ins happening because t- different different airlines have different clusters at different times i think to, to manage it so i walked all the way to that the other end of the building and there was not one line so i got in really smoothly but then getting to to um Shippel, and that's why I don't have your cigarettes. Uh, it's because, it's because it, oh, that's another thing. Pro tip because I've flown through Shippel, and Charles de Gaulle will do the same thing, and Heathrow will do the same thing. If you go, if you buy things at duty free on your first check in leg. leg, those three fucking airports will confiscate that it's shit. It's so happened wrong. to me yeah. three times. So wrong. And so, you, and so you have to buy from them. Oh, it's so and, wrong. And, and then, and then they just have it's like some shakedown like mafia shakedown they have just like treasures of all this uh, shit that they take from people so shit. so i waited for shippo and then i had a rush because everything was delayed so that's it oh, I'm, I'm home i'm home oh, I'm ex- you're home temporarily exactly. yes exactly yeah. you know um i've got to ask you because yes, yes. knowing you as i do as right. a fairly naughty adult <laughs> <laughs> yeah Sure. And having met your mom, who oh, I, yes. <laughs> I doubt has ever, but I have to know, taken the paddle to you. I, you must... no, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, the reason I ask, and I, I mean, no right. matter how naughty I was as a child, I only, I, I only remember one uh, spanking with a shoe, which I'm sure I deserved. I had that. some spankings, but I, they're nothing that stuck in my mind. Well, yeah. why I ask you this is because right now, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little quiz on this. Missouri school district reinstates corporal punishment after parents called for their kids to be spanked with a wooden paddle instead of being disciplined with suspensions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, now. Yeah. All right. This is since when are the teachers, uh, the sadist to whack your, whack your ass. Well, I, I, a I mean, lot of teachers are sadists for sure. Well, uh, we know, we, especially yeah. if you're going to Catholic school. But right. what's interesting is they're not the only ones. Uh, there are 19 other states where corporal punishment in school is legal. I was wondering if you wanted to guess a few. Of uh, those. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Call and, them and, out. And, and this is why I'm guessing the way this is, again, a whole group demographic that are just like, I remember a time when a man's a man, a woman's a woman. It's it's all this old school trying to preserve some bullshit. Well, I, I guess and, never having been never having been really spanked as a child uh, had me develop a fondness for it in adult life, both receiving there and there you go. Oh, there you go. All right, saying. so here, here's here's my all list. Right. There's 19, so go ahead. Uh, Tennessee. Um, Kentucky. Yep. West Virginia. Eh, not in there. Ooh, okay. All right. Uh, this is in the zone. Um, Keep going. Alabama. Yep. 
uh, Louisiana. Sure. Mississippi. Yep. I'm, I'm having a pretty high bat, batting average in this. Oh, you one. only got one. You only got one wrong, and there's and there's quite a few others to go. go yeah, ahead. Uh, Georgia, Georgia. Yep. South Carolina. Yes. How many more do I have? Well, uh, there's 19 all together. Keep going. You're in the right section. Uh, uh, Look at for, can, uh, can, Kansas. Imagine the map. Yes. Texas. Yes. Uh, all right. So, Nebraska. No. 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 Okay. Fine. Fine. Close, but no. So. Actually, no. All right, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, it's North Carolina, because you know that's a change yes, demographic. North, yes, North, North Carolina. So North Carolina. Okay. Um, hold on. Um, Indiana. Yep. Oh, 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 oh I'm really. Doing I'm so really good. doing well. You're doing better. <laughs> you're doing better than the 50 questions about hippos. But yes, I mean, yeah, yeah. You're yeah, nailing I'm, this. Come I'm on. really got. It. You got Fuck. a few more. Come I got on. a few more. Hmm. One. One. I, this, can I have a, a one? Hint? Yeah. Go ahead. A, any in the north? Nope. I mean, I guess Indiana is technically kind of in the north, but that's but, as far north. Well, there's some. I mean, I don't consider the other two that are northern to be northern because they're actually post Midwest. All right. Uh, coast Midwest. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, between uh, between the coast and the Midwest. Okay. 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 Come okay. on. Come on. Ohio. Ohio. No. 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 Okay. 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 Between coast and Mid. All right. So uh, Virginia. You're on the wrong side of the country now. All right, all right, all right. So, all right, so by Wyoming. Yes. Um, uh, Idaho. Yes. <laughs> uh, Montana. Nope. Um, Arizona. Yes. Um, <laughs> in the batting ninety. <laughs> all right, I'm just gonna I'm gonna fill in the others. What, yeah, which gonna, ones? Which ones? Arizona. Yeah, we got Colorado, that. Colorado. Colorado's surprising. Okay. Florida. Florida. I was gonna ask that, but then I was like, ah, eh, but yeah. Arkansas. That, uh, that's I should have gotten that. I should have gotten that. A anyway, uh, I don't. Uh, this is just uh, it's, it's just, just ridiculous. These, these are also the states that don't Punish want everybody women for women, everything. They don't want women to have a the right to an abortion. It's it's the same fucking it's places. Ex exactly. It's, I don't say, it's, it's so weird about tribalism and just like all these things that have nothing to do with each other, but they do. And they, everyone has a line up on this one side. It's, oh, uh, it's, 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 and I, I, I don't know why the parents subdivide the punishment or the or just the guidance that a but child may, might need. It makes no sense. It's like it's like you can't tell my kids what to do, and then right. like, then they want this. It's like what? You it's can't tell all... them what to read. Like we grow yeah, on yeah. them reading this, but then again, oh, it's so ridiculous. This country, it's like freedom, is, freedom. It, yeah, this country is so far backward up its own ass. It's it's just getting it's mysterious to me at this point. It is it beyond is, mysterious. It's so bizarre. Bizarre. I, I've got um, I got a couple stories here. Um, yeah, you better spit them out. <laughs> okay, I, I got them. All right. Um, well, here's a here's an animal story. To, I guess it's kind of light, but it's not. There is video of this bottlenose dolphin behavior that it's no no one's ever seen before. Now, the reason why they have a video of this is because it's one of these Navy dolphins. I've heard about uh, this. It's one of these Navy dolphins. Go that go, yeah. they, they, they go there to uh, they're trained to find mines. Just kind of go like, what are, what's a dolphin sound like? Wah, wah, some kind of sound like that. I guess in their little flipper way, they tell these uh, admirals what's going on. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but anyhow, they, and there's rumors that they're used as uh, kamikaze uh, soldiers, too. But that's who knows but they're, they're there to find mines but this one started wolfing down exactly eight uh venomous yellow belly snakes well, which, which they've never seen because usually dolphins work together like in packs and they very uh, friendly very friendly this one went rogue and it was just like super happy but they don't know why but i me and you probably have a theory why i think the thing was getting drunk oh uh, yeah i think the thing was getting high I think that because it was kind of acting solo and, and they're, they're not, they're known to play with snakes, but they're not known to eat them. Yeah. And, and it was going rogue and it was eating this venom. Now it wasn't, it came back. Okay. It could process the venom. I guess it's liver strong. I don't know what, cause, cause the uh, sea snakes are the venom. Oh, that's venom's ones eight, are extremely eight of them. venomous. Eight of them. Eight of them. He kept on finding them. So, so definitely has an acquired taste for them. And I think he or she, I don't know what the sex was. The dolphin. <laughs> I think, I think, uh, I think it was, the dolphin, rogue, it was a rogue, rogue flipper. Yeah. I think it was getting high. Well, I think it was getting high. This kind of leads to my next story. Okay. Like, plants appear to be self-medicating by producing their own aspirin when stressed. Now, this is kind of an important 
an, an important discovery because so a new study is taking a closer look at you know the particular self-defense mechanisms in plants and how the production of an active metabolite of aspirin salicylic acid is regulated now, of course, it's like kind of the common thing that's in, you know, aspirin. So plants are producing basically their own aspirins. And what's great about this is uh, why it's being studied is that because the environmental stresses, for instance, I mean, the same with plants. I mean, we might get sunburn, okay? But plants, you know, in, in infestation from bugs or drought, so now they're able to, uh, scientists see how they self-regulate, which might be very helpful in this, the time of climate devastation. So they're looking into this and how to improve resistance that will be critical for food supply okay. as increasingly gets much hotter, which, you know, we're, this is, how is the weather in Europe? Because I mean, the heat wave is everywhere at this well, point. You know, heat wave and the floods, you've heard about the floods, like yes, in, in, in Texas and yes, in, yes, really in the, bad. Uh, the South. Well, is, yeah, well, well, first of all, uh, in Switzerland and Germany, the buildings, right? Uh, the insulation is so much better. It's not just like, just contractors trying to bid the lowest and the, the shittiest fucking uh, uh, elements being used. You have really good insulation. So even with the no, now England doesn't have the good insulation, but in Germany and Switzerland, even when it would get up to like 90, it would stay cool in those apartments. And, uh, and then, and then it, I think this has a macro effect on the whole city because when the sun goes down, it's quite comfortable right. here well, well, also, yeah. it was the right. same kind of degrees here. And I'm like, why is it just awful? All but the time? well, also Germany, I mean, unexpectedly, oh, not, not if you've been there, has so many trees. It's kind there's of astonishing. Too. There's, there's, there's forests, there's so many trees, of course, Switzerland as well. In, in, in Zurich, you have that river going right through the middle of the city, right. in a big city. It's crystal clear. Everyone's swimming in it. They, they have this, like, it's like four Olympic pools of like fence off yeah. with a lifeguard you can jump in i mean it's just uh, but it's you know this is a country close yeah, well, well, well these countries in the world yeah well here we have the east river and the and the hudson river <laughs> yeah, and, exactly and i think it was just con ed that was um indicted for how a oh, really dumping you know more crap into the hudson river anyway now scientists have just discovered the first ever this is really interesting to me the first ever physical material capable of remembering its entire history of physical stimuli. God, implant that in my brain, please. Okay. So the team from the Polytechnic in Lausanne, Switzerland, oh, speaking well, of, yep, stumbled there. upon this remarkable property while researching phase transitions of vadium dioxide. It's a compound that's often used in a lot of electronics. So they were trying to, it was at Mohammed Samazadi Niko was attempting to figure out how long it takes for VO2 as it's, uh, as it's called to transition from one state to another, but it soon realized that something that was never before seen was happening with an electrical, when an electrical current was applied. So the current moved across the material following a path until it exited on the other side. So as the current heated up the sample, it caused the VO2 to change state. And once the current had passed, the material returns to its initial state, okay. But when they applied a second electrical current during the experiment, they observed that the time taken for the material to change states appeared to be directly related to its history. So in other words, it's the first material that seems to remember the first phase transition and anticipate the next. Ooh, now, wow. what's interesting about this is that major implications for the advancement in electronics that rely on memory to perform calculations. So by having the memory effect be an innate property of the material itself, the researchers claim it could enhance the capacity, speed, and ultimately the miniaturization of electronics. Which you're you know, even I, more miniature, you're saying? Yeah. And you know, which is, you know, I'm nano, extreme, nano. I'm extremely, extremely interested in uh, nano, nano, nano. Wow, that's going to get mean, dangerous. But yes. ter terrifying. Yes. Absolutely terrifying. Well, speaking of terrifying, I got oh, a couple, couple oh, terrifying I stories. Oh, do uh, so I have one too. I can't. Wait well, uh, so. <laughs> uh, this is in Iowa. Uh, Which is maybe, terrifying enough. Yeah, sure, sure it is. This teen was uh, kind of walking, going through the woods and didn't <laughs> know what it was, but discovered a skull on a stick. Um, reported to the police and they, the forensic team came out and did their thing and they concluded it was, um, what was her name? 
Angela Bradbury. Well, what's interesting is not that long ago, we had a story about somebody in the woods finding a suitcase with some yes, remnants yes, in it. Yes, exactly. Or, Angela the sto- or the storage space with corpses in a suitcase. Oh, Christ. Go ahead. So a- Angela Bradbury was last seen. Uh, she got arrested in 2021 for trespassing. And she goes there and then she's kind of hanging out. There's like a courtroom county jail. It was specifically called the Cerro Gordo County Jail. And there's surveillance of her leaving with a, a similar age white guy. <laughs> and then one, she, of the, one of those. Then she disappears. Well, oh. well, there was there's one guy that fit the profile, Nathan Gilmore, 23. He had just gotten out of jail, like maybe for a couple of days. And he had his arraignment thing. And they're like, well, could you come across this girl? And he's like, well, I did find a girl. She kind of fits a description, but I don't know her name or, or any of that stuff. And I can't remember where I left her head. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's where that's where it's going. So they felt like they had enough evidence. I mean, they, she was just missing. They didn't know she was dead or they didn't know anything. But then they found out she was dead. And then they went back to his house, at which, at which point they found like this map. And it was all Uh-oh. written. It was all written in blood. It was it was all written in blood with coordinates of where exactly the head was found and the date at which she missed is missing. So, of course, they fucking take him in. And then he wrote in some kind of Internet lingo. Someone is tired of living. And uh, he's he's got he's got he's. You know, yeah. he's got a lawyer and I guess, stuff. I, but... guess he's, I guess he's lucky he's not in Oklahoma, which I hear in the next uh, 29 months is going to try to execute 25 people that are on death row. Uh, 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 well, 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 one other thing. So also in the coordinates in that map and all in blood, there is a picture of a goat head on a oh. stick in a pentagram. Ah, so, yeah. <laughs> you know. See you in Disneyland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, speaking about nightmares and this literally is a nightmare. So um, Kofi Atta, 47 years old from South Ghana. Ghana, yep, Kofi's a... He cut off his penis while dreaming about chopping meat for his family. Now, he's a farmer and he suffered this horrific self-inflicted injury on August 12th after dozing off in a chair and dreaming about preparing food. Now, he claims he has no idea how he ended up clutching the knife in his sleep and waking up in a pool of blood with his hmm. penis missing. And he says, he just doesn't remember anything. He dozed off. He went to sleep. No wonder I have fear of sleeping. So upon realizing the consequences of this hor- horrendous act, he began shouting and two of his neighbors came over and, and helped. So, you know, he was taken to the Kampo Anake teaching hospital in Kumasi, a critical in- a condition, underwent treatment and was stabilized. And four days after the accident, he, told reporters he'd been giving fluids and injections, but the doctors say, of course, he will need surgery after he completely severed his genitals. Now, that's somebody that really feels nothing below the, the belt. I mean, so it's, but he recovered his severed penis. Well, the thing is, he's unable to pay for the treatments, and it's unclear whether the hospital was willing to perform a pro bono or pro uh-huh. <laughs> operation. And his wife arrives at home shortly. And but, you know, I mean, uh, look, we uh, parasomnia, that's, you know, the name given to any number of things that people do while sleepwalking. We have a friend that I hear arranges furniture in their sleep and people sleep. Yeah. I mean, I, as a very small child, would sleepwalk out to the street occasionally or, you know, I once I remember I remember I must have been three. This is before I had the spinal tap to see how damaged I was. And I thought I saw Peter Pan in a hole in the wall, but I'd go out to the street. I'd like open the refrigerator, maybe try to piss in there. But I stopped sleepwalking very quick. I mean, I, you know, that's well, I, I, I mean, I all gave, I'm admitting to all I'm admitting to. Simon, I almost gave Dave Budden <laughs> heart attacks because he would sleepwalk. And one time he was just keeping me up and I just heard him probably bouncing. sleep drink. Uh, you'd sleep. Yeah, I bet he would sleep piss. He would sleep you know, all types of shit. Trust me, it was messy. And then you'd be like shouting, hey, Dave. And then he'd wake up and have these like, ah, like freak out, um, which was not well, which was not so nice of me. Um, anyway, yes. a, 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 any, anyway, you know, uh, speaking of nightmares, I, I kind of. All can, right. One more. Well, I, I have a couple more stories, but I, I, was, I was cutting to the chase. I wanted to give a little shout out. 
uh, and condolences, uh, Jamie Branch. She died uh, uh, two days ago. Um, you didn't know about you know yes. Uh, no. Yeah, wow. yeah, you can look it up. Wow. Um, the Trump I, female. Yeah, 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 player. yeah. I I know how she died. Yeah, she, I, I, I've known her. For, she's been hanging out for for. Right. Uh, she died a couple of days ago, and um, they found her. And um, the family hasn't announced. Um, I know how she died, but the family hasn't announced it yet, so I don't want to really say it here. Um, until well, it's been tragic. officially announced, but um. W- a couple of fun stories about her. Uh, she, you know, it's in, interesting as because you have this documentary that you're uh, selling right now. And oh, she was not, a, actually not that I'm selling that I'm trying to get funds for our artists, depression, anxiety and rage. No, yes. up on GoFundMe because because so many people, 73 percent, they say, of musicians suffer from depression and anxiety. Yeah. So it's kind of fitting with that. She was always very jovial and fun and on the outside, uh, vivacious, but, but we had a few heavy conversations. And then from that point on, just like you, she would, you know, your friends will contact you and I, in the community, you support each other. So she would contact me and we'd have some conversations and, uh, you know, try to help her get through yeah. whatever it was she was going through at the time. And the, um, a couple stories. So she had a dog, she, she was a dog lover. So one time she was kind of really low on money and, uh, she needed her sister who lived deep into New Jersey and she needed someone to help drive her and her dog. And that's what actually, when I really got to know her and I said, I can do it. So we drove a couple hours, did that. And a couple of times later, she would have the dogs getting older and help her take it to, to the vet. But that was her, that was her best friend. And then I was at with pulverizer sound. I was at a Wells hustle in Austria and her dog had died. She had found out there and she found, we, she found a dark corner away from everyone and kind of had a, she cried on my shoulder and it was, it was a really sweet moment. It was, but it was, uh, I, it was, I felt, um, no, it's happy sad. about that, having that connection with her that, I, you know, I, I can support, you know, everyone has to support each other in this world. Especially and, also, in the- and also animals are very helpful for people who have depression. I mean, they, 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 start, they really are helpful when you feel you can't turn to anybody else. And of course there are always people that you can turn to. That's especially how you and I are, Tim. Yeah. So, oh, and one other, you remember, remember when after the Super Bowl party, I was like talking my brains out because me and her went to that mafia bar alone <laughs> and sat there and that some bartender like beat the crap out of someone. And we're just like sitting there with a drink with like this. It was like a real Scorsese, Scorsese moment where someone's being mutilated behind us. That was that was a whole other story. But anyhow, she could roll. She was a good time. And uh, I'm very sorry. I, to hear I'm that. really sorry. I, I'm really I feel bad. For, you know, reaching out to her family. And, but every, I think everyone's really upset. She was only 39 years old. So, um, so that was, that was a heavy one. So rest in peace, Jamie Branch, you'll be missed. And exactly. And, and, and that's why it is so important to turn to friends, to have a pet. Uh, there are a lot of people that are in the same, you know, that are suffering on various levels of depression, anxiety from wherever it stems from childhood, adulthood, existential angst and all of this, but there are people that will listen and people that you can turn to and, that's just, you know, why both you and I exist. And that's why I'm making this documentary with Jasmine Hurst. So, you know, and, yes. on a, and on a lighter note, this is and will and shall forever, or as long as we can stand it, be the Lydia and Swim with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, episode number 163. And speaking about nightmares, James Johnston, as I like to refer to one brother, James, uh, Gallant Trunk, Nick Cave, PJ Harvey, of course, one of my favorite outings, big sexy noise. Now painting, paintings which are like childhood nightmares. And that's what's here now. So remember this. You have a friend, even if we at first appear like fiends. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and as I like to call him, brother James Johnston, songwriter, singer, vocalist, keyboard player, one of my favorite guitar players and songwriters, who was in... uh, the much un, not heralded enough Gallon Drunk, who's played with PJ Harvey, Barry Adams, and Nick Cave, and of course, his favorite, at least my favorite project, Big Sexy Noise, <laughs> and now a painter extraordinaire. Welcome, James. Hi there. Hello. Yeah. Hey, James. So I'm, I'm in the shadows here, but uh, good there's to see Tim, you. There's Tim Dahl. Hi, Tim. 
Where are you? To? I, I'm I, I'm in Zurich right now, and I, I'm this is like the only time I can squeeze it in some festival like Pussy Riot and all this stuff. But uh, so I'm kind of finding the further furthest away spot to do this. But uh, Wait, be what patient. About, what, what about Pussy Riot? Are you at a festival with Pussy Riot? Yeah, yeah, I was just hanging with him a second ago. All right. Well, you know me. I've been staging my own Pussy Riot for 43 years. However, <laughs> I don't need to tell you that. How are you, James? It's been too long, too long. Yeah, God, no, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Uh, I can't even, I was trying to think earlier what the last time we saw each other, unless it was stinking Larvik for that. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Last, well, let's, okay, let's, let's, start at the, let's start at the end of the tale of Big Sexy Noise. Yeah. I believe our last performance caused quite an uproar. I'm going to I'm going to tell a bit of the version and you're going to carry it on. We were invited to do some festival in bumfuck Norway somewhere. You and Ian had arrived a day in advance, already hating the imbecilic promoter who, um, I mean, I had been warned about, but I knew he would pay. So I get there the next day. We all totally despise him. He does some hideous, tedious act wearing like green platforms before us. And then big, sexy noise in what is going to be kind of our goodbye to noise <laughs> fest. I don't even know if it was exactly our last show, but it certainly was a bang. What happened at that show, James? Please do tell. Well, I mean, it, it was actually our very, our very last gig. And, you know, the, the first signal this guy was just king of the assholes was the poster for our gig was a photograph of one of his shoes <laughs> oh god execution and mandatory and um so well we we uh so, so it's our last gig we're about three quarters of the way through and all evening this guy's just been a complete pain in the ass everyone in the everyone in the venue hates him Everyone involved he's sitting in the, in the front row, by the way. He's Everyone hates his hatred office behind place. him and in front of him. Go ahead. Yeah, it's really off his place, complete wanker. And, and, uh, all, and we're, we're, we're chalking up all our drinks onto his tab because all the bar staff fucking hate this bloke. So they go, <laughs> oh, look, let's put it on his tab. So we've got all our, we're all having like multiple drinks <laughs> and um, everything's going <laughs> on this tab, which in, Norway is like you know fifty quid for a pint. So, yeah. And then, then uh, just near the end, we're we're finally we're getting to play our last um, forever on the run. The last track, the last track we we're ever going to do, which was actually going to be that pretty bizarre cover of Three Dog Night we were oh, doing. Oh, the only second time we had done it where I suggest you had never or Ian ever heard Three Dog Night. So I suggest you just play a rock rift and I was going to do a, a mashup of One is the Loneliest Number, Mama Told Me Not to Come. It's, it's <laughs> a brilliant version as well. This weird sort of like a strip joint version of that. And um, in the middle of it, this bloke, just completely off his face, got on the stage and started, oh, he started grabbing the instruments, grabbing my guitar. Then he got on the stage, I pushed him off and he sort of damaged himself a bit. And then Ian, I think, you, pu Ian, I think you pushed him off so hard he almost broke his leg. <laughs> it did look quite impressive, but, and, and there was no audience at the front to catch him. So he went, just went into a load of chairs because it was such a, an appallingly <laughs> organized shit gig. And Ian's just stopped playing and stood at the front of the stage, pointed down at him going, you fucking cunt. How dare you get on your, get on our stage? I'm going to kill you, you miserable arsehole. And <laughs> the gig just ended. And then we went outside and, and the few people who were there from Larvik, were still, we were treated like heroes. Everyone was going, we hated this guy all our lives. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming here and humiliating him. So, yeah, that was the last gig we did. But, but the follow-up, James, was it made the front page of almost oh, every yeah. newspaper in Norway. With, Whoa. I think, you and, and Ian, Ian pointing in his face because the whole country hated this fucking cunt. Absolutely. Oh, my God. Well, you know, maybe one day some sort of mad rock geneticist will <laughs> pump, pump life back into big sexy noise and... Send it back out into the environment of Eastern Europe to rampage around again. <laughs> and it'll be that concert. As a matter of fact, I know that Tom, one of Tom Gerritsen's friends taped that concert. We definitely need that footage. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, let's go back in time a bit, James. Um, 
when did you know that you were destined to be a, the grand rocker you are? When did that first get in your blood and what was the first outing of that? Um, I don't know, I've got, I've got an older brother. He's about four years older and he played me. I, I, I could accuse him, he sort of ruined my life by just playing me Endless Stones records. The, the Stooges albums, Velvet Underground, all that stuff when I was really young. And it was just so, ex it's so, so exciting. The first Pill records, the first two of the, that, that sort of stuff, I was just obsessed with it immediately and borrowed a guitar of someone at school and um, just eventually, I've had a, a whole, uh, like a, a weekend job in a hotel and I saved up my money, got a guitar and I remember the very first time I ever got feedback out of a guitar. It was like, fucking hell, is that, wow. You know, I've been listening to White Light, White Heat. Like, <laughs> well, that's what it is. You just stick it in front of the amp. And there you go. This, you know, transportative moment. And anyway, yeah, I just joined a band near where I lived and then where moved was up that? to where, where, London. Where, no, yeah, where, where... Well, I grew up in Guildford outside London. It's about 30 miles away, so not very far, but a couple of the people who were in that band, we ended up sharing a house up in London and started um, Gallon Drunk with them, which is the band that I was doing for then subsequently for like 30 years. And uh, yeah, it was just like the most exciting thing I could possibly imagine. I'd been chucked out of... Um, um, King's College doing philosophy. I, 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 in order to get to London, I, the only way I could get there was to go to university to get a grant because in those days you could get you you were you were paid to go to university. So I went there, and within a year I was chucked out. And out of finally, the philosophy, out of philosophy, yeah, philosophy. James. And, and because your grades, because yeah, of your grades, or, or... Ian, Ian White, the the drummer, he was at the same. Uh, university as me and he was chucked out at exactly the same time and I, I, I had no idea neither did he until we met each other like 10-15 years later Wow! and both realised we were all maybe less than that but yeah I sort of did that and I was living in these really shitty little bed sits in, but let, let's um, just ask, people who don't yeah. know what a bed sit is and I do because I know a lot of people yeah. that lived in them and having lived in London for two years in the early 80s a bed sit is literally a single bed with the space of a single, with a, with a single, with the, bed, with the space of a single bed right beside it. That's about it. That is it. And, and there's a shared toilet, you know, with a whole building. And I was in there and next door was um, members of the scientists, Australian bands. Um, Stu Spasm was next door. <laughs> well, we've, was had him, we've had him on the show, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, in fact, I've got a painting he did of me in that room. But... Um, so, yeah, it was just straight straight in there, and I sort of never really turned back from that, really. How long did it take you to graduate out of a bed set? <laughs> yeah, it took forever. And, and, then, mm -hmm. and then a shared house with a couple of sort of like wacky goths and a sort of pervy bloke. And, uh, <laughs> I'm sure we've all, we've all done that. But, yeah, well, you so, say you're, you're, you're grinning from ear to ear about mm -hmm. this, so I guess it was a pleasant experience. The pervy bloke, I ended up in a band with him, so, uh, yeah, so. <laughs> not, not because he was pervy, he was actually quite a good musician, but as it turned out, he was a bit pervy. How long did it take for you to actually get the finite gallon drunk? Because you, you were to toiling at that for quite a while. And, for instance, I remember that Cedric, the lead singer of Mars Balto, once told me, Gallon Drunk was his favorite band. He had a magnet. I Whoa. didn't know you had magnets on his refrigerator. And Mars Volta is one of my favorite bands, along with Big Sexy Noise. <laughs> yeah, in fact, yeah, he sent me a message and said that um, he first saw Gallon Drunk. We, we ended up supporting, of all unlikely things, supporting Morrissey in the States because he'd Whoa. seen his commit. There's a time, there was a cinema in, in London called The Scala where you could go to all nicers. That was just so fantastic. They showed, you know, Kenneth Anger films all night, or Russ Mayer films, or whatever. You know, I and, played there. Um, I played there before. I don't know if you ever did, but they'll show yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. So it was near, a great place. Yeah, near the end of that, 
they, they were taken to court because they showed um, A Clockwork Orange, which was still banned in the UK at that time. It is? Oh, I was? It, it, yeah, okay. because... Uh, that was Stanley the 80s, Kubrick, James? The 80s? Stanley, yeah. Was it that the 80s? Uh, yeah, exactly. Stanley Kubrick had said that he didn't want it shown in the country because there'd been all these reports of copycat crimes, so it was banned in the country. And, and then we ended, so to support the Scala who had been fined by the film company, we did a couple of gigs there and Morrissey came and saw one and invited us on this tour of the States. And that's where- How Cedric the hell was that? And that's where Cedric saw you. It was ridiculous. I mean- Yeah, I, I can I spoke imagine. Him, I spoke to him for about five minutes in about two months. Um, well, it's probably quite enough. And, um, <laughs> You know, we were we were allocated something like twenty minutes to play, right. and we had to, you know like an, an eight, you know eight pack of beer between us, and they'd fly everywhere, and we'd be chasing after them in a little van. But it, it was brilliant fun, you know. Sure, my my friend played drums for him on one tour, and oh, yeah, really? the story, yeah, yeah, it was like a twenty-seven page rule book about you know, oh, how, I mean, you, how I, to behave. I, I mean, stuff. look, anybody that, I, mean, I, I I can't say enough bad about Morrissey, so I won't say anything because it would take up the entire freaking show. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're, you're going through with, what were some of the other memorable moments? And I, I have two really fantastic gal and drunk stories, but what were the other, I don't know if, if opening for Morrissey was memorable, but I mean, because you had a lot of near, I'll say near misses, I mean near hits. I really think it was a completely unheralded band that you just kept at and it was so exciting. It was such a sexy band. And then I want to ask you about your unique talent for playing the guitar through a guitar and a bass amp. But what were some of the other highlights you feel of, of Gal and Drunk? Well, I don't know. It's just, I, I really do, I'm, I'm sort of, proud of the, the absolute never say die attitude of the band they, you know regardless of not being championed by anyone or being on a particularly big label or anything we just absolutely kept going and played every every gig like this this is we've got to play it like it's our fucking last gig because it you know it might be and as a result it was always just so fucking exciting you know, James, really you are, James, you are extremely exciting on stage to me, as is Ian White, which is why I was so thrilled to have big, sexy noise. But OK, so you, let's go back to what you were doing. So you have the gallon drunk, but, you know, you might not have had the audience you deserve, but other people much bigger than either of us. And they were, we're both stubborn, which is why we keep doing what we've done. Other people, other like PJ Harvey, Barry Adamson, Nick Cave called you to their McCarvey called you into their fold because they saw in you <laughs> what the general public is usually too fucking stupid to see in anybody that's really good. Talent, I mean, originality. I mean, yeah, I'm sounding like RuPaul now. Talent, originality, uniqueness, and whatever else there is. <laughs> Sexiness. And you, you know, you notice know, like, you know, if, if you keep going at Long your enough. thing, yeah, you know, you, you end up meeting all the right, you, you end up meeting the right people and it's, nothing's particularly planned. It's just paths crossed because you're stubborn and you keep going and you're, you're all doing something exciting and you know, eventually you end up meeting, you know. So yeah. we ended up, we did a really long tour supporting PJ Harvey that was fantastic. And that subsequently ended up sort of 30 years later joining her band and, um, yeah, just doing all sorts of stuff and getting to know the bad seeds through my brother, who was writing a book about them, and uh, Cave coming to see Gallon Drunk. And then I joined for like the first time I played with the bad seeds was in 1994 because Blixer was doing a play or something, and they'd signed up to do Lollapalooza, which I, th you know, I think, you know, Blixer just thought, I'm not fucking doing that. That just sounds so shit. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I was quite happy to step in and do it. And who else was on? Who else was in a lineup of the Lollapalooza it was, tour? It was a really, really fun tour. Actually, L Seven were on it, and they they were fucking brilliant. They were just so great to be on tour with. Um, it was it was supposed to be Nirvana. That's why um, the, the Bad Seed signed up to it. 
but it was 1994, Kurt Cobain died, and it ended up being the Smashing Pumpkins. But oh yeah, but, it's, but, but 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 they were you know there were bands like the Boredoms on it. And, oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, there was there was some fantastic stuff actually, and really sure. nice people. Well, you're going um, all over America, which must have been great. Yeah, the Flaming Lips were on it, and we played all these weird venues in the desert and whatnot. Yeah, it was a, a fantastic experience. It was something like 42 gigs back to back. Wow. And by the end of it, I remember seeing a picture of the band before we started. And at the end of it, there was some awful um, record signing thing in LA. And everyone had like changed shape and size. Half the band were either enormously bloated or just looked so skinny they looked like they were just about to die. And um, <laughs> such, a, such a good good fun thing to do like, <laughs> later you almost die it's what we do of course it's a great thing well yeah, so, yeah it, was the same, it was the same year james clavunos joined oh okay so we were the newbies so i was hanging out with jim and it was brilliant fun really great uh, clavunos of course an all-time comrade of mine is just one of the most joyous people on the planet oh cheers Which, james cheers so james. How, how did that oh, cheers too. How, how, how did that uh, tour work in terms of just the logistics? Would there be two kind of backline production crews? And they, if it was 42 in a row with a million bands <laughs> playing basically <laughs> in front of thousands, how did they even do that? It was like two different crews and they just pick, they just leapfrog? Well, wait, wait, wait. The Lollapalooza wasn't every day of those 42 days, was it? It was a few days and then in between you had other gigs or what? Uh, we didn't play any other gigs. Oh, wow. We played, actually, we played one gig in San Francisco. But now that reminds me who else was on the gig. Uh, George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic. Oh, one Robin. of our favorites. Oh, cool. like, yes. Oh, so um, every day I'd be so bored in the hotel, I'd go in early with the crew and watch them because they were on before us, which is, you know, all of this was so weird. And watch them every day. And they were fucking brilliant every day. And it, in between, so. We'd play in the afternoon and then they'd drive off, play a gig in the evening, and then we'd see them the next day and they'd, they'd have lost another sound man because they just, if you, the, the thing was, if you didn't get on the bus with them, that was it, you were out. <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't get on the bus, they were out. And not everybody um, could party that hard, I'm sure. So there yeah, you go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there was like um, one gig when only George Clinton turned up because oh. his family were. <laughs> Something had happened to them at customs, you know, there, there was something on the bus or whatever, and he was there. And Nick had also been stuck at customs, so the rest of the bad seeds were there. And he came into our dressing room and said, Look, I'm, I'm really fucked. If I don't play, I'm going to be fine. So will you, will you be the band? Whoa! Whoa! Now, and we were all like, What the fuck? And he was saying, Well, it's just, it's just on the one, everything on the one. And it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Like, oh, oh boy! Well, no, all right. And as their merchandise, they had these little, um, little mini pacifiers that blew bubbles. On the <laughs> and he went round every member of the band and put them round our neck and said, "You know, like you are now a member of the band," and put these things on us. And we're walking up to the stage, and um, at that point, their bus turned up, so oh. we didn't get to it. But wow. uh, you know, it was, it was that sort of thing. And yeah, they, they were fucking great every day. What a great experience to have. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, not, what a highlight. Go ahead, Tim. Sorry. Not to jump too far forward, but this uh this last P when I saw you last in London, you had just finished the last PJ Harvey tour, um, yeah. which seemed to be like a massive success. Uh can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, just yeah, that whole experience. Um, yeah, it was kind of peculiar because you know i hadn't played with us well you know we'd been supporting her in 1992 and then in whenever it was like five years ago um i was just sent a message i would you like to come in the studio next week it's like or or, or even tomorrow it was something really imminent i just thought oh, fuck. Well, yeah i'd love to but I'd well, what am I doing? Were you calling um, for guitar or keyboards, James? Because you're also an incredible, you know, you're incredible on keyboards well, as well. Well, you know, so I didn't really know what to do. And I decided I, I was just moving 
and I had my grandmother's violin in the in the room. So, so I thought, oh, well, I'll take that because someone might use it. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up playing the bloody violin, and you know, I hadn't played it in school. And then I ended up playing it on the whole tour. Wow! And it was it was. It was it was great being really thrown into the deep end like that. And well, you know, because that was a large ensemble, right? Like, how many musicians were on stage yeah, for that tour? It was a ten piece. There's three drummers, something like five guitar players. It, it did sound fucking massive when it was going, and and also brilliantly wonky because if you're playing outside with all that brass and all these, it was all these really lovely old vintage drums that they go out of tune one way, the brass goes out of tune the other way. The violin goes, as it goes out of tune the other way, and it sounded like a sort of Salvation Army band. And yeah, that's, that's... they're done with this real sort of um, regimented. It was like being on a, on a, a like a theatre production. It was so different to anything I'd done before. Um, well, James, she, 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 anything I... fresh was great, isn't it? So, and she was playing sax for part of that too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's her first instrument. Okay, okay. But James, I want to talk to you about some of your theater or film experience also, because you've done music for films. You've done different kinds of all out of the rock stage musical events. So talk, talk a little bit about that. How did you get involved in first doing any music for films and what was that? Um, I can't even remember. I think it was just, you know, usage of gun and drunk stuff. And then I ended up, doing some stuff for TV and some film schools. But well, what then, about Ken Russell? I'm trying to think. Yeah, that, that was the next thing that came up, was, was actually uh, sort of being in stuff. I was in, this, uh, in a fantastic film by um, Olivier Assayas, the French di director, who um, he made a brilliant film recently called Personal Shopper with Kirsten Stewart in it, actually. It was a was the film. film you were in was called Clean. That's right, yeah. That's a really good film. What was that so about? I, uh, well, in, in that, I died of a drug overdose within about 20 minutes, but uh, Nick Nolte was my dad. So, um, oh boy. Oh I boy. see the resemblance. <laughs> so ridiculous. It, it, it happened because someone who was working in the casting, their partner had made a gallon drunk video, you know, a million years before. And they thought of me when this part came up. So as a dying junkie, which you were not. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> but you've been so, surrounded by. It was just a you know amazing experience and going out there and um Nick Nolte flew out and you know we went for went for dinner with him and he turned up with his pockets full of these all these whiskey miniatures that he'd been collecting on the plane and uh, oh, all the actually and you know he said uh, oh you know I've, I've i've been down to the docks and got all these clothes and he's wearing all these really stinky clothes and he'd swapped all his clothes with the local dockers because he's saying you know that that's my character I, I used to work on the boats and it he was really sort of full on um method stink yeah method actor stuff, but also completely laid back and Supportive and funny, and did, yes, you, have to, did you have to get a, an American accent for that, James? No, thankfully, they, they quickly uh, gave, they gave me some sort of backstory where I um, didn't have to yeah, talk. No, it, it was fine. I, I could be English for that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so go, going back to Gallon Drunk, I mean, and talk about you know different opportunities you were given. Correct me if I'm wrong. Were you like on top of the pops or some one of these uh, English uh, music? Kids shows, I guess. I don't know how you describe those lights. Yeah, uh, that, yeah, that's that. That's like that. That that was the most famous and cheesiest, and you know, kind of brilliant TV show over here. Um, in the you know, seven. You know, I grew up watching it in the seventies, and you know, it's the first time you'd see David Bowie would be on glam the was glam prevalent. All kinds of yeah, things. Really sweet, yeah. all that shit. You know, just like fucking Slade, all this brilliant stuff. And um, that, but that, that uh, top of the pops thing was with um, the bad seeds because oh, okay. yes, then it was uh, Blixer wasn't there, and they'd done a song with Kylie Minogue, 
And for some reason, I needed someone to mime his guitar part. Ah. You know, which seemed absurd, but I thought, fuck it, I might as well do it. So, yeah, so you couldn't, you weren't allowed to play live on. You weren't allowed to play live on top of Pops, right? Everything had to be mimed. Yeah, sometimes they had live vocals. I think this, I can't remember if um, Cave and Kylie Minogue mimed it or not. Probably. Uh, Jeff, um, what is, Jeff, I don't understand this fetishization of really normal soap opera gals like Kylie Minogue. Do you get it? No. Thank you. Enough said. <laughs> Didn't think so. <laughs> Thank you, James. So, James, Gal and Drunk, PJ Harvey, Nick Cave in the Bad Seas. How did we come to work together? Because I don't really recall. I know that I had w- been working with Terry Edwards at first and doing like some psychoambient jazz noir, just, you know, vocals, backing tapes and sax. How did we come to expand? How did I come to expand that concept? Yeah, I don't know, yeah, I don't know why you needed a guitar, but... Um... <laughs> Anyway, it happened. I remember we went, we went for like one rehearsal and, and then played in a venue <laughs> of, of some festival in France. And it actually, the very the very um, first gig, I remember you pissed on the stage right at the front. James, that was not pissing, was it? <laughs> it was so fucking brilliant. I, I, actually, James, that was not urination. That was a squirt. Well, no, Thank it was, you. It was, it was a near, it was a, an approximation. Well, it was a, I mean, it's, it's strange because a big sexy noise often made me extremely moist. Well, it was from <laughs> <my> <laughs> <baby>. <laughs> <laughs> And this was even before big sexy noise. So I remember, I know how, I remember how big sexy noise started is we had been doing a few of these psycho ambient word based jazz noirs thing, but it was, at a festival in Italy where Ian and I were standing outside and he goes, we should have a rock band. And I'm like, okay. And he said, it should be really big sounding. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, sexy. And he said, yeah, noisy. And that was it, big, sexy noise. So of course we thought of you. And I, so I want to ask you, James, as absolutely one of my favorite songwriters I've ever worked with and favorite guitar players, how did you develop your style of playing because Big Sexy had always had no bass player and it was fucking huge sounding. How did you develop your style of guitar through a guitar amp and through a bass amp? <laughs> and an octave I mean, splitter. Well, I, well it, it, I can't even remember what I used, but um, you know, I'm, I'm not the most uh, technical person at all with, with music and pedals or anything like that. And all, all we knew is it just had to be as fucking big, well, and sexy and noisy as as possible. It just had to be massive, and, and the only idea I, I had was I put super heavy strings on the guitar, tune it down to C instead of E, and split it and put it through a bass amp as well, and then figured out how to do that. You know, I had to go in a guitar shop and be humiliated as normal, going, "Oh, I don't know how to do this. What do I do?" and you, know, you mastered it, my friend. You mastered well, it. Was it an a- so it was an AB box? Really hey? So it was an it, it was an AB box with just a d- yeah. d- 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 guitar. I thought it was an octave splitter. Excuse me for that. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. No, I had an octave splitter and uh, and then put it through uh, an AB box thing as well. So it was like fucking enormous sounding. As a three, as a three piece, as especially as a three piece, drums, guitar, and vocals. That is guitar times two, really. It was enormous. And James, we wrote the songs really fast. Yeah, super fast. You know, and you know, a, a lot of people write stuff um, uh, online now because you know, since COVID. But th- th- this was, I don't know. This was a long time ago, wasn't it? 12 years, 15 years ago. I, mean, I don't really even remember how long ago. I can't remember. It's just the only way we could do it was really right. I'd just put a load of riffs, send them over to you, and it, it would seem like it was like 10 minutes later or something. They'd come back and it'd be like, fucking hell, that's brilliant. I, and, I um, think there's some of my best lyrics. I think it's some of the best songs absolutely. I've ever done. And also it was extremely sexy when there's songs like, uh, your love don't pay my fucking rent. 
another man coming while the bed is still warm. I mean, these are classics in the big sexy noise repertoire. And you know, Retrovirus now does Forever on the Run. That's a killer song. I really love that. We had a lot of killer songs and uh, I just, it was one of the, the most fun engagements and also one of the longest outside of Retrovirus that I've ever engaged in because it was just that much fun for me. We had a lot of, we had a blast. No, it was brilliant fun, but I suppose, you know, like, like pets, sometimes the kindest thing to do is, is put uh, it to bed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah, so so you, so a question. Yeah, so we never made a bad record or, you know, brilliant. we never had a bad gig. I don't remember any bad gigs. No, absolutely. I mean, I think I laughed more with, with, with Big Sexy Noise than I've laughed in. I was afraid of breaking Ian's ribs by having them laugh too hard sometimes. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. So, I mean, did you, I, I, I don't know if I read this right. So now that you're doing a lot of painting, are you not doing music anymore for now? Or, or are you still? Not, not that much. I mean, I've um, done a couple of records with, do you remember, do you remember Steve Gullick? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. of course. He was a photographer, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, Steve, fantastic, lovely bloke. Um, I've just finished a second record with him. You know, we're, we're not going to play it live, but it's a it's a st- left of sense a weird record that's a bit like um, I don't know, um, Big Star Third or Lee Hazelwood goes sort of modern classical. Quite, you know, a strange record with loads of strings on it, and it would be impossible to play it live, and probably not much fun. So we just made the records and. We've got a new record out with that in a, in about a month. What's that called? What's the new record called, James? Uh, Everybody's Sunset. The first one was called um, We Travel Time, and they'll be both they'll both be out on a label called God Unknown. Uh, yeah, and that's out in about a month. But James, uh, is it more interesting to you at this point to do? I mean, look, music is in your blood. You're you're gonna do it. Yeah, but to totally. do it doesn't mean you have to tour everything live. I mean, I've done a lot of music in the past that I did not or could not tour live, which is well, why I mean, Metrovirus yeah. is exciting to me because I can tour things I haven't before. But not all music has to be toured live. And is that something that you, what was it about touring live that you're just like, okay, I've had enough and I can understand it, although I still do it because I love um, it. You know, I, I did love it and I, I probably will love it but um <laughs> i don't i've just done it so much and you know we we toured a lot and that pj harvey tour was really full on and then by the end of that i'd found it's something yeah it is it, it is exhausting and you know being I, I found something that um you know it's so fucking exciting for an hour it's, it's exciting even being in a van but uh, with like, the, <laughs> it's a great laugh but you know the, the, the really intense part is an hour or two isn't it at the end of the day and I found something where I had a studio and a, a painting studio I'd go in there and I, I didn't expect it to be exciting but it's like you're fucking on it for like eight, eight hours a day it's, it's exhausting in a different way but you can just walk home and it's thrilling it's, it's almost like just watching a movie all day just seeing this stuff happen and it's obsessive and it's all the same things it's it's just as as exciting as sticking a guitar and amp and hearing all that feedback I, I find it is i really one of my favorites is mother's shoes which i'm just going to describe it which is a very dark room with a window and outside it is very i think it's pale green and it's kind of a monkey child in a pair of very large shoes. There's something so haunting and creepy about it. I mean, Edgar Gorey would be very pleased with this. Were you always painting, James? I know that at one point on tour, you you had your you had a little scrapbook of stuff you were working on. But when did this painting fixation take it? It's just just um, in the last five or six years, really. I mean, I've always loved you know expressionist painters and um... who's some of your favorites. Yeah, I, I don't know. There's someone I really like. If and he's got a quite an unlikely name, a German painter. If were, were anyone to listen to this and think, I'll oh, Google someone. 
Norbert Schwantkowski. It's a really Schwantkowski, really, what a great name. He's, really, he's just a really weird, interesting painter of their like strange little haikus of sort of existential tragicomic despair. And uh, you know, I love his stuff and uh, you know, more obvious things like Edvard Munch and but um yeah, it's oh, just it's Goya, just, Goya uh, one of my favorites, especially absolutely fucking love absolutely Goya. Adore Goya. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I mean your paintings are very haunting. They're very they're they're not it's not that they're childish, but they are like children's nightmares. I think they would be great to illustrate a horror story for children. Now, uh, is this something deep embedded inside you that's coming out in a different form than music? Um, I, th I think it's, you're able to, when I started doing it, I, I found that I, because of the style of music that I normally do, only, only certain things sort of fit into it. And it was really weird to be able to access more different aspects of horror from your psyche, you know, and that's a really you know, great point, James. Comedy as well. That, that all these things are quite difficult, but that you did all this stuff, all this stuff comes up and you, you can't necessarily channel it into an uh, in, into the sort of rock music that I was doing. And that's such a great point because when you're doing a musical concept, and I'm a, I am a musical conceptualist, that there is a certain parameter that the music, yeah. when you have a band, whether whatever the band is, when you have a musical concept, there is a certain parameter that you're kind of locked into that you then express within that. So you, you, what you just said is within the, the oeuvre of painting, that you can expand beyond just that one dimension, even though you've had many dimensions in music, within one oeuvre, you can just expand beyond that constraint. Yeah, and, and really surprise yourself and, and get a lot of stuff out that probably needs getting out. <laughs> get those crows and cats and, and <laughs> as I like to call them, get those creeps out of your mind. Because your yeah, paintings are, those, I mean, you're, all those secret horrors, they're all shared horrors, aren't they? And they're, and they're all um, archetypes and they're all things people respond to. Because they're that, creepy, James. And I don't consider you a creepy person. I'm a creep, but I don't paint yet. Now you're inspiring yeah. me. <laughs> I don't have to it a bit quiet, you know. <laughs> you keep your do you have a under, the, under the rug. <laughs> do you have a, uh, anyone representing you, like a gallery or anything like that? Yeah, that there's a, a gallery in um, on the coast uh, over here called uh, Don't Walk Walk, and we're doing a show coming up soon. Opens on the 14th of October in an old. Uh, it's in a medieval castle on the coast. Yeah, it's so oh. perfect. That's so perfect. It'd be great, you know. So I'll, I'll have about 40 paintings in there, and also some wooden sculptures that I've done with a friend called Corin Johnson um, that are sort of like weird animals and stuff. And But it's all set within this mad, amazing old castle. Uh, so yeah, that's coming up. And I, I've got most of the work done already, but you know, like typically with anything, you know, it'll be like wet paintings. So, being yeah, to the last minute. Paintings. So James, will you, will you create a soundtrack for that exhibition? I always find it very well, interesting. Yeah, no. um, I, because it's my own gig, uh, I, I wouldn't, but um, I asked Jim if he'd DJ. So, uh, oh, if Jim Scalabunas? Uh, yeah, so hopefully he'll come and DJ, play some creepy castle, spooky cat music. Um, <laughs> creepy cat, yeah, castle, yeah, so, creepy and, and cat also, music, I love it. There's a weird series of pictures of uh sort of odd existential distancing of these sort of lost uh astronauts floating near planets and and that they're all going to be in one room and we'll have some recordings of uh uh you know all the sort of bleeps and intercom stuff you you get with eight with 60s footage of 
uh, space travel in that room and yeah so we'll try and create a, a proper ambience for it as well, well there's some great there's some great soundtracks that nasa has been putting out and you know i love the nasa website i love to see oh, a new image that, i mean just recently the imagery they've come up with oh, um, yeah. I, I so, saw, beautiful. so beautiful so amazing but then again, I also love, you know, soundtracks like The Sound of a Spider Web being made. So just recommend. <laughs> James, do you, do you uh, listen to less music now that you're doing it less? Uh, funnily enough, that the only music I listen to in the studio when I'm painting is uh, classical music. I just have, a, I have the radio on. Um, over here, it's Radio 3, which is just nonstop classical, because anything else. A any favorite composers? Um, to be honest, I, I try to have it, have it on really quiet and I try and it's almost like avoiding listening to music, but yeah, I've got loads of fav, fav, uh, favorites that are sort of uh, modern, what well, you know, the sort of holy min minimalists or whatever, you, well, well, like Gorecki and, uh, of course. R R Reich, you like Reich. And, uh, there's, there's all, all sorts of really sim simple, uh, modern composers that, that just make this absolutely quite austere, beautiful music. But I, I like medi medieval music. I, I like Beethoven, and yeah. I, you know, I just leave it on. But if any really irritating opera comes on, I just turn it off. <laughs> yeah, Understandable. I cannot stand it. But um, yeah, I just anything that just helps you drift off, you know, in, into the ether. And that's always been the same with whether it's rock music or painting, the whole point of the process is to transport yourself somehow or maybe make something that creates a story that transports other people. I mean, don't you think? I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. For sure. You, beautifully put, James, exactly. So, so James, you, you, have a, you, you share some, uh, a similar story to G.W. Bush, <laughs> who after his uh, known career went on to be a painter. Have you checked out any of his paintings? No, not at all. I will do. <laughs> They're bizarre, man. They're bizarre. Uh, I mean, they are really freaking weird, but so is he. Uh, he's well, on, he's nothing wrong with that. Well, a lot wrong with him, but yes. <laughs> so, James, <laughs> well, I I, was. James, another thing <laughs> I find very fascinating about you is some of your exotic trips onto really bizarre destinations. I remember you once told me, I don't know where you are going. But you said you have to watch out for giraffes who might stick their head in a window on the second floor and then bite your nose off. I mean, where where is the most exotic location that you've that you've taken a, a you know a, a destination to that was really um, fantastic? Well, for you? just before I mean, it was it was such brilliant timing just before COVID and lockdown. In fact, on the way back, um, Nicola and I, my wife and I were. were you know, obviously tested for COVID because it had just started. We'd been to Kenya for a month and it was fucking mind blowing. I mean, I, I was there with people who'd been there before, but we were, we were in a very small, rickety, cheapo sort of car driving around. And um, the first time I saw an elephant, <laughs> I didn't even think about it. I just went, oh, fucking hell, that's an elephant. And everyone in the car started laughing. But then this thing started trumpeting and it came up. Well, and by the way, just a minute, James, because one of your grand nicknames is Jumbo. Jumbo. And that's well, I, I started calling you Jumbo because of your sound. But then you revealed that you had been called Jumbo when you were younger. Well, you know, once a Jumbo. <laughs> or was it jumbo? Well, I wonder if you met nice. any elephants that painted. You know, they have they have ah. in, in, in India. They have you know the elephants that paint. I'm just wondering. I saw you... a fucking brilliant bit of film the other morning of um, <laughs> a horse playing the piano with its mouth. That, oh, that's been worth searching out. I, I, I just saw something about a monkey who found a a cell phone in his cage and dialed nine one one, and they were like. What the hell is going on? <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. Uh, Tim is very fond of animals, often has animal stories. But as a scuba diver and a surfer, he would. And as somebody who's encountered grizzly bears on his travels, he, he has. A, he a has. Yellow. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had, I've, I've, that's that's for another time. I've had four. We've, we've told that story. Yeah, before. Well, good thing you didn't run into a hippo, or maybe you did. 
because oh, uh, well, those things are deadly. Oh, oh, oh. We could hear hippos outside where we were sleeping. Oh, no, oh, where? In Kenya? Really in... Ugly sound. Oh, can you oh. imagine? Your head would be crushed like a watermelon. Absolutely. I mean, on our last road trip together, Tim and I, I Tim, to save ourselves from falling asleep and boredom, we, I did go through 50 facts about hippos because we are kind of obsessed with the most hideous animal known to man. <laughs> <laughs> Terrified but of they're, hippos. They're, they're stunningly ugly. What uh, else yeah. did you see it, in Kenya? What other animals did you run into? Uh, we saw a leopard. We saw lions. We um, saw giraffe. Um, no, so it was people don't lots, realize how dangerous giraffes. Lots, are. Yeah, as Nicola just said, lots of baboons oh. att attacking this cafe we were in. That Wait, what? Say that. Okay, tell but, all. Okay, baboons attacking well, the cafe. We were waiting to go into. We, yeah, we were waiting to go to. Um, this elephant sanctuary, that a very famous elephant sanctuary, um, but we had to come back in an hour. So we stopped off by this motorway. It would be like stopping off at, you know, um, an auto grill in Italy. Right. Or a something. truck stop somewhere. Except suddenly it was attacked by all these baboons. And, <laughs> in Kenya, um, out of nowhere, a sudden baboon attack. But the, yeah, yeah, so that this is um, just outside Nairobi, but they're, they're fucking huge. Oh, and uh, Nicola was chased into a lavatory bar of baboon as well. That was scary. scary. We were at this fantastic place called um, Devil's Gate or Devil something or other. And um, we were waiting to enter this park. And, and suddenly this baboon ran in, into someone's car. And all these girls ran out the other side. Going, a, a, ah, it's the baboon. A and rampaging it rapist a baboon. It's terrifying. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen one close up. They're the oh. ugliest, most fucking hideous things you can imagine. Yeah, so she was chased into this <laughs> public toilet by one. And uh, luckily... She, she had to lock herself into the stall. Well, no, well, luckily some, some guy came in and started sort of attacking it. Oh, so my it word. Away. What about mandrills, those kind of baboon things with like the They're rainbow co color? Too. Yeah. Or what's Certainly that one no. mo monkey with a giant, like, schnoz? Uh, I forget what that thing's <laughs> called. Horrible. That's what it's called. Horrible. Yeah, there's one called the Dutchman monkey, isn't there, that has a particularly big, big nose. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of, yeah. Well, you've got to be very careful out in the wild, as we all know. Animals that's right. will attack. And as, can you blame them? No. Absolutely any, not. any foxes seen in your backyard recently, James? I um, you know that in Britain, there's a, in, in London, if right? You, if you look out the window, if, in fact, if I you know, looked out the window right now, I'd probably see one. And this one, that, for some reason, regularly uh, comes to our front door and shits on our doorstep. <laughs> God. Bastard. Maybe he's pissed that you haven't made a painting of him. <laughs> or maybe if you make yeah. a painting of him and you put it outside your door, he'll stop shitting there. <laughs> Good idea, James. Good idea. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, they're quite co concise little shits, but it's it's amazing how mm -hmm. stupid they are. Wow. They're lo lovely beasts, though. <laughs> That's funny. We love our <clears throat> an we love our animal friends. Well, one, one thing I did see a lot. Of, I don't know if we're sort of going off track too much, but do you remember Toby? Yes. Toby Winter, lovely Toby Winter. Toby Winter, who's the, Cary Grant, who's the Cary Grant of alternative music and philosophy. Exactly. He played maracas with Gallon Drunk and, uh, and all, all sorts. He, um, I, went, I went to stay with him recently in Croydon, which is a, like a bit of a shithole, and you wouldn't expect to see anything interesting there. But, <laughs> except um, for Toby Winter. Yeah. Except for Toby Winter. And five badges. I don't know if you get badges. No. Yes, you do. Five it was badges. Like four. There they were. Well, I saw four raccoons in my backyard the other day, oh, and I'm nowhere you. near the woods. Oh wow! Oh yeah, we have a lot of them in Brooklyn. I, I don't know. Uh, trash pandas are not my favorite. Uh, oh, Tim, no. Tim's house was invaded by raccoons in the past, but what can I say? They're out there. They look cute, and they're deadly, like most yeah. of my like most of my lovers. <laughs> <laughs> I think nice. those, those tiny little teeth are, 
They must be pretty sharp. I think. Well, no, it's not the teeth. They have thumbs, so they can do all types of stuff that humans can do. And um, they're not really afraid of humans. Uh, I, never look up a raccoon with alopecia. I mean, a raccoon with no hair. That is. No. Uh, yeah. That's one of the. That is nothing. Looks nothing like a raccoon well, with hair. You, 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 know, you, know, you, you, <laughs> you know, I love the giant squirrels of India, which are colored like yeah, parrots. Well, they're, they're fantastic. They're fantastic. But uh, one must be careful. And what's now becoming the inner city wilds, as all I can say. Absolutely. <laughs> James, how did you deal with COVID? Was it great that, that you were in painting mode at that point because you could just trot off to your studio and do your paintings. Oh God, it was heavy. What a relief, right? It was just fantastic. I mean, I, you know, the horror side and the, and the horror of worrying about people and people who are vulnerable, and elderly people and family, apart from all that, it was just incredible. And being in the middle of, you know, we're right in the middle of London and, two years of it just being empty and walking to the studio and then coming home and um, seeing Nicola in the evening and we'd just sit outside on a bench and have a, have a, have a can of beer or something. It, it, was, it was blissful. It really was. It was incredible. We did well during the pandemic and it really helped you in this podcast because it really just, you know, bringing various people into the fold who we know or didn't know who are connected in some way by just being stubbornly independent artists that will not stop doing something to get the burning out of their soul onto the page, onto the canvas, onto the stage, onto wherever it counts. That's what we do here. That's what we all do. That's why I love you, brother James Johnston. That's why we've worked together. And that's not the end of that either. We shall continue even if it's just in conversation. You're one of my absolute favorite, most adored people, favorite songwriter and guitar players. And I love your paintings. And this is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and my brother, James Johnston. Thank you very much, Lydia. Thank you. Great to see you and you, Tim. Yes, likewise. And I uh, hope to see you sometime soon. Mm -hmm.